Uh, good morning for those of you on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, good evening to those of you in, in Taipei. Thank you for joining us for this discussion of the future of U.S.-Taiwan economic relations. I'm Walter Lohman, Director of the Asian Studies Center here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, before we get started, just two quick uh, housekeeping notes. Um, one is, just so you know, we'll have this um, program recorded and available on our website within the next 48 hours. And number two, we'd very much like you to be a part of the conversation. So you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen um, a, a box with all the directions, et cetera, in it, and you can go in there and submit a question when we get to the Q&A uh, period here. So this program takes place against the backdrop of some very big news last week, the announcement on uh, access for American beef and, and pork imports into, um, into Taiwan. I know to a lot of the people outside of this relationship and and uh, the friendship that we have with Taiwan probably thinks that's a pretty technical issue, but but it's actually something we've been working on for 13 years. And and uh, and Tsai Ing-wen and her government deserve incredible credit for finally taking the bull by the horns and and, and dealing with that. But the economic relationship with the U.S. and in Taiwan uh, between them is is much bigger than. Um, that one issue or many of the other issues we have, or even the tremendous opportunity in a relationship that has strategic content. And so we've got uh, Dave Stillwell, Assistant Secretary of State for Asia Pacific uh, with us today, as well as Minister of Economic Affairs, Mei Hua Wang, uh, who's going to uh, talk to us as well about the broader uh, relationship. But before we start that discussion, we wanted to uh, turn the program over to B. Kim Shao to, uh, to uh, give some introductory remarks. Uh, B. Kim has uh, been a friend of the Heritage Foundation and probably half of Washington for a very long time, uh, going back to her days uh, at the DPP uh, through the Chen Shui Bian administration into the current uh, regime through her time in the LY. She, she has quite a long resume and close connections with the uh, powers that be in Taiwan. We're so happy to have her here in Washington, and we're really glad to have her on today's uh, program. So uh, let me turn the uh, video feed over you over to you, B. Kim, if you want to uh, start us off, just turn on your, your webcam. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you, uh, Walter, and your colleagues at the Heritage Foundation for organizing this very timely event on Taiwan-US economic relations. When I arrived here in Washington, D.C. just over a month ago, I made it my mission to work to ensure that through this relationship, we could build on Taiwan's freedom, democracy, security, and economic prosperity. In light of changing global security and global circumstances, this mission has given me a very full agenda since my arrival. So I'm therefore honored to be here today to open this session and this very important discussion with uh, two of my very significant partners in my work here in Washington, Assistant Secretary Stilwell and Minister Wang Meihua. I know that Assistant Secretary Stilwell has dedicated most of his career to ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific region, where Taiwan's survival and security are critical to the overall stability of this region. Today, we're discussing an, another important dimension of the broader security, and that is Taiwan's economic security. The COVID pandemic has brought upon significant economic challenges and difficulties to both of our countries, and of course, to the global economic situation. As Minister Wang will discuss in her speech, the disruption and movement of supply chains around the world, the security and integrity of our technologies, the urgency for both, a con both of our countries to create new employment opportunities, lead us to believe that there is no better time than now to initiate discussions on a bilateral trade agreement. Furthermore, in the Asia Pacific region, RCEP and CPTPP are in the final stages of ratification 
and formation. Taiwan's economy is highly dependent on trade, and we cannot afford to be marginalized from new regional trade regimes. So last Friday, President Tsai made a significant policy announcement on market access for beef and pork, which addressed longstanding issues in the bilateral trade relationship. It was a difficult decision because as expected, she put herself on the front lines of a political storm out of a longer term strategic interest for the country. The strategic interest is to further deepen trade relations with our major partners, integrating and diversifying Taiwan's economy with the world and building the necessary international confidence in Taiwan's commitment to international standards of trade. President Tsai has exhibited her leadership and determination to prepare Taiwan for negotiations for a bilateral trade agreement. A BTA would provide the strong infrastructure needed to deepen our trade relationship and it would be a signal of confidence to businesses in both our countries. I really do appreciate the message of support from many friends here in the United States for President Tsai's efforts. We heard from Vice President Pence, from Secretary of State Pompeo, from USDA Secretary Perdue, and from Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. And of course, bipartisan voices of support have been the most consistent basis for our bilateral trade relationship. And we truly appreciate the friendship and support and commitment to strengthening the relationship between our countries. And at this particular time on the mission that I had set out to accomplish, and that is for Taiwan's freedom, democracy, security, and economic prosperity. So again, I want to thank you, Walter, and all of your colleagues at Heritage Foundation for putting together this very timely event. And I'm sure that Assistant Secretary Stilwell and Minister Wong will have a lot to say on this topic today. Great. Thank you very much, Vikin. Thank you very much. And welcome again to Washington. It's, it's terrific to have you here. Um, well, next I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Secretary Stilwell. Um, I think it's fair to say that our relationship at Heritage with uh, uh, Secretary Stelwell goes back to his time at the embassy in Beijing. As many of you, I'm sure, know, he was our attache there in the embassy back in 2011, 2013. He was in the Air Force for 35 years. Uh, and then I think Dave, uh, Secretary Pompeo, pulled you off a beach somewhere in Hawaii, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and, and brought you back into this mess here in Washington. Um, we really appreciate you doing this. You've been so open with us and, and all of our friends and partners and maybe even some of our uh, not so close friends in Washington. You've been just so open to the policy community here and really appreciate that and, and really appreciate you uh, sticking with us on this event. You know, we've tried to pull this together for a while, um, but there's been such incredibly pressing things over the last six months or so that, that uh, that it's foiled us a couple times. So thank you for sticking with it. Thanks for, for being with us here today. And we very much uh, look forward to your remarks. Uh, let me turn the feed over to you. Thank you, Walter, uh, for that kind introduction. And um, Director Xiao also really appreciate the, uh, the lead into this. Um, this is a great opportunity to restate and clarify U.S. position, not only on the uh, economic relationship with Taiwan, but the relationship at large. Um, it says a lot about Taiwan, uh, especially before the corona uh, virus hit. And a lot of the uh, tourism from the mainland to uh, Taiwan would see the sights during the day and, and you know, enjoy the, uh, the culture and all that. But at night, uh, you heard about folks huddled around their TV and watching what a vibrant democracy looks like and hearing open discussion back and forth and criticism and support for government decisions and the like. And, uh, those are the things that make Taiwan special. Um, for these uh, visitors to the mainland, uh, this experience uh, reminds them that no one person, party, 
uh, anyone can monopolize the minds and thoughts of all Chinese uh, people. Indeed, the, those experiences served as most compelling tourist attraction of all, uh, a vision of a democratic Chinese society and polity uh, that's prosperous, harmonious, free, and highly respected by people all around the world. So if you visit the National Palace Museum in Taipei, you see the treasures that escaped the communist Red Guards and the horrific destruction of the Cultural Revolution. In Taiwan, you can see a Chinese society that flourishes free of the toxic brew of Marxist Leninism and Mao Zedong thought uh, that battered the mainland. Taiwan is a highly advanced $600 billion economy with 20 million, 23 million free people. And it's also a vision of how much Chinese people can achieve. Until recently, Hong Kong provided a similar vision. Because of this, and more than ever, Taiwan is important to America and important to the world. It's a good friend to nations that seek help, whether in dealing with Ebola or COVID or, or the other problems faced uh, in the world today. And it's for these reasons that we Americans focus so much on Taiwan and why we admire its leaders and its people and its institutions and its symbolism in world affairs. It's why large bipartisan majorities of our elected representatives signal consistent support for Taiwan and for its people and for the values that it represents. Now there's a lot going on today uh, in, in regard to US-Taiwan relationship. Uh, to refresh, the Taiwan Relations Act directs that the United States will continue engagement with Taiwan to maintain stability in the Western Pacific and support commercial, cultural, and other relations between the people of the United States and Taiwan. As I'm sure everyone knows, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar traveled to Taiwan earlier this month. He met with President Tsai Ing-wen and other senior members of her team to promote stronger health and economic ties, especially in light of the devastation of the coronavirus. Secretary Azar's trip was a continuation of our long-standing support for Taiwan. For years, we regularly sent cabinet officials to demonstrate our principled and sustained support. Uh, last week, uh, the American Institute in Taiwan director, Brent Christensen, joined Taiwan's foreign minister, Joseph Wu, to issue a joint declaration on 5G security, expanding cooperation on data protection, freedom, and human rights. In May, Secretary Pompeo and Commerce, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross welcomed the announcement uh, from TSMC, Taiwan's world-leading semiconductor company, declaring its intent to invest $12 billion in Arizona to manufacture the world's most advanced semiconductor chips for use in 5G and other applications right here in the United States. To build on this great momentum, I'm glad to share today that the United States and Taiwan are establishing a new bilateral economic dialogue. These talks will explore the full spectrum of our economic relationship, that's semiconductors, healthcare, energy, and beyond uh, with technology at the, at the core. So given these various actions, you may wonder whether the United States is trying to signal policy change. The truth is, all those things I just outlined are entirely consistent with our longstanding policy. We have sent high-level delegations and officials to Taiwan before. We regularly conduct meetings with Taiwan's leaders, facilitated by the American Institute in Taiwan and Taiwan's representative office here in Washington. We and other countries, uh, I might add, have approved significant arms sales under this and previous administrations. For nearly four decades, U.S. policy has been guided by the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, the three joint communiques between Washington and Beijing, and the six assurances provided by President Reagan to Taipei in 1982. In fact, uh, so all of these policy elements are important, but I'd like to dwell for a moment on the six assurances, uh, partly because there's been some confusion about them over the years. In fact, I'm pleased to announce today that the administration has declassified two cables that detail the six assurances and underscore their importance. So here they are. First, the United States has set no date for ending arms sales to Taiwan. Second, the United States has not agreed to prior consultation with Beijing on arms sales with Taiwan. Third, the United States has not agreed to any mediation role between Beijing and Taipei. Fourth, the United States has not agreed to revise the Taiwan Relations Act. Fifth, the United States has not agreed to take any position regarding sovereignty of Taiwan. And sixth, the United States will never pressure Taiwan to negotiate with Beijing. These were the six assurances that President Reagan made to Taiwan in 1982, and they endure today. I invite everyone to go to the website of the American Institute in Taiwan, where these documents are now posted. Last year, we declassified and posted another related memo written by President Reagan 
in August 1982. In the memo, President Reagan wrote, quote, the U.S. willingness to reduce its arms sales to Taiwan is conditioned absolutely upon the continued commitment of China to the peaceful solution of the Taiwan PRC differences. In addition, it is essential that the quality and quantity of the arms provided to Taiwan be conditioned entirely on the threat posed by the PRC. It is important to review history like this because Beijing has a habit of distorting it. So we should go back and consult the facts as often as we're able. Those facts were clear and they're still clear. The US has uh, long had a one China policy. This is distinct from China's one China print or Beijing's one China principle under which the Chinese Communist Party asserts uh, sovereignty over Taiwan. The US takes no position on sovereignty over Taiwan. The fundamental US interest is that the Taiwan question be resolved peacefully without coercion uh, and in a manner acceptable to the people on both sides of the strait, as Beijing promised. Meanwhile, the US maintains extensive, close and friendly unofficial relationships with Taipei, including commitments to assist Taiwan in its self-defense pursuant to the Taiwan Relations Act. We have changed nothing about these longstanding policies. What we are doing though, is making some important updates to our engagement with Taiwan to better reflect these policies and respond to changing circumstances. The adjustments are significant, but still well within the boundaries of one China policy. We feel compelled to make these adjustments for two reasons. First, because of the increasing threat posed by Beijing to peace and stability in the region, which is uh, a vital interest to the United States. Uh, in recent years, the Chinese Communist Party has targeted Taiwan with diplomatic isolation, uh, bellicose military threats and actions, cyber hacks, economic pressure, United Front interference activities. These actions challenge the peace and stability in the Western Pacific. So let's be clear, these destabilizing actions come from Beijing, not from Taipei uh, or Washington. We support the longtime status quo across the Taiwan Strait. Beijing has unilaterally altered it through flipping of diplomatic partners, pushing Taiwan out of international organizations, stepped up military maneuvers and other activities. So we must act to restore the balance. Other peace loving countries should do the same. Looking at Hong Kong, it is clear that Beijing is willing to disregard the international obligations to extend its authoritarian system and box in freedom loving people. We no longer have the luxury of assuming that Beijing will live up to, uh, to peacefully resolve its differences by Taipei, as it promised us in three communiques. And while we continue to honor those agreements, I assure you that the United States is fully committed to upholding the Taiwan Relation Act, fulfilling our uh, commitments under the six assurances as well. We will continue to help Taipei resist the Chinese Communist Party's campaign to pressure, intimidate, and marginalize Taiwan. The United States has responded and continues to respond to increased PRC military pressure uh, by providing necessary defense articles and other support. As China's military equipment and technology rapidly advance, we believe it will be uh, increasingly critical for Taiwan to invest in and deploy resilient and cost-effective capabilities that can be credible deterrent to that growing PRC threat. This includes building an effective territorial defense force as a key part of that overall deterrence. The second reason we have been focusing on our engagement with Taiwan is simply to reflect the growing and deepening ties of friendship, trade, and productivity between the between United States and Taiwan. While they may be interrelated, our relationship with Taiwan is not a subset of our bilateral relationship with the PRC. Our friendship and cooperation with Taiwan stands on its own, fed from the wellsprings of shared values, cultural affinity, and commercial and economic ties. The U.S. Congress, reflecting the will of the American people, has worked hard to ensure that our friendship with Taiwan further flourishes. Recently enacted by a huge partisan margins, bipartisan margins, the Taiwan Travel Act encourages visits at all levels, while the Taipei Act calls for a much more active role for Taiwan in international organizations. We are fortunate in America to have a vibrant Taiwanese American community, which serves as an important bridge between our two peoples. With a population of 23 million, Taiwan continues to punch above its weight in economics as well as governance, thereby making uh, the world a better place. That success has been all the more remarkable considering the many challenges and external pressures it has faced from across the street. I know many of you have witnessed Taiwan's vibrant democracy and civil society in action. Walking the streets of Taipei, 
I marveled at the openness of Taiwan society and the seamless integration of its democratic system with, culture, with traditional Chinese civilization, Confucian values, and in, indigenous cultures. A morning run in Taipei takes you past uh, Taoist, Christian, and Muslim places of worship in quick su succession. This is a tribute to Taiwan's uh, religious freedom and pluralism, principles that are under threat all around the world and perhaps nowhere as much as in China. America and Taiwan are members of the same community of democracies bound by our shared political, economic, and international values. In March 2019, Taiwan hosted the first civil society dialogue on securing religious freedom in the Indo-Pacific region. At that dialogue, Taiwan announced its pledge of $1 million to the State Department's International Religious Freedom um, Fund to provide critical assistance to those around the world facing discrimination for their religious uh, uh, religion and or beliefs. Last year, we convened the first U.S.-Taiwan consultations on democratic governance in the Indo-Pacific region, highlighting some of the many ways Taiwan is a model of good governance for Asia and the world. Surely, former President Lee Tung Hui, who passed away earlier this month after doing so much to transition from authoritarian governance to a thriving democracy, he must be pleased at this tangible evidence of his life's work. We have been celebrating his many contributions to multi-party democracy in Taiwan, including the first peaceful transfer of power to a rival political party. Secretary Azar's trip to Taipei further highlighted Taiwan's great success in marshalling accountability and transparency in the battle against COVID-19. Taiwan has not only been able to maintain a low number of cases and fatalities, it has also lent a helping hand by donating life-saving PPE around the world, including millions of masks to the United States. The coronavirus pandemic highlighted Taiwan's strength as a global supply chain leader. After COVID-19 emerged in China, Taiwan mobilized its domestic industry and became for a time the world's largest manufacturer of surgical masks. Of course, Taiwan already is well known as a critical node in global high-tech trade flows and US technology supply chains, including for semiconductors and smart machinery. The announcement of TSMC's investment in Arizona illustrated this. TSMC's decision will shift critical technology supply chains back to the United States. While China seeks to dominate emerging technologies and industries, we work with trusted partners like Taiwan to ensure that next generation technologies, data, and intellectual property are protected from theft and manipulation by malign actors. This is all part of a great Taiwan story, a free market economy that embraces innovation, entrepreneurship, and private sector-led growth while holding true to its democratic principles. Given its track record, it should be no surprise that Taiwan is currently the United States' ninth largest trading partner. In 2019, Taiwan was seventh largest U.S. agriculture import or export market uh, by value. It ranks as a top 10 market for U.S. soybeans, corn, beef, wheat, fruit, poultry, and processed foods. This is the context for the welcome announcement made on Friday by President Tsai removing restrictions on U.S. pork and beef ex uh, imports. Now that this important announcement has been made, I would expect Taiwan to become an even more important trade partner of the United States. On behalf of the American farmers and ranchers, I would like to thank President Tsai for demonstrating vision and taking these bold steps. I'd like to close by reflecting on Taiwan's role in the world. The United States has long worked to elevate Taiwan's profile in the international community. Consistent with Taiwan's global importance as a trade partner, a democracy and model of resilience against malign influence. The global cooperation and training framework is a prime example. Since 2015, the United States and Taiwan have co-hosted capacity building workshops for the Indo-Pacific region on issues ranging from anti-corruption to media literacy to women's economic empowerment. Last year, Japan joined us as a full partner in this program and we have co-hosted GCTF events with other friends. We have just started to take these uh, workshops on the road to the Western Hemisphere. Taiwan's outsized support for the global community in response to COVID-19 has illustrated its capabilities as a, uh, and its generosity as a partner. We welcome the expanded engagement seen recently between Taiwan and countries in Europe, the Indo-Pacific, Latin America, and beyond, including visits, parliamentary exchanges, sister city pairings, trade and investment deals, public health cooperation, technology partnerships, and more. These engagements bring value to partners and promote stability and balance across the Western Pacific. 
in international organizations, the time has come for more countries to cooperate in expanding Taiwan's membership in fora for which statehood is not a requirement uh, and its meaningful participation, whether as an observer or otherwise uh, in those for which statehood is a requirement. In this latter category, I'm talking about the World Health Organization, the International Civil Aviation uh, Organization, Interpol, and others. We should no longer countenance the bullying and, co and coercion of 23 million people that prevents us all from benefiting from Taiwan's experience uh, and its expertise. So in closing, I appreciate the invitation to give these long overdue remarks today. Uh, earlier in my military career, I had scarce opportunity to engage with Taiwan. I'm glad to see that is no longer the case. And I hope many others around the world similarly get uh, to turn more of their focus to Taiwan, to the many opportunities for productive exchange, and also to the vital uh, issues of security and international peace. The United States could not be prouder to work side by side with such a good friend as Taiwan. And we are restating our policies to underscore that we will continue to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell. Those were very welcome remarks. Um, I particularly like that you put things in the context of longstanding US policy, because it seems like you come under attack from two sides on that, from the side in Washington that wants to just throw the whole uh, framework away, and then the Chinese side who wants to portray everything you do as being uh, contrary to longstanding U.S. policy. And, and, and in the long run, what they're really trying to do is is morph the one China policy into their one China principle. And I think on our side, we're not consistent enough across the administrations, and it gives them openings to do that. There's a lack of understanding about it. And, and what this administration has proven is that there's so much we can do within that framework that we have barely scratched the surface of. And, and so I, I really like that you put things in, in that context. Um, I know you've got to go in just a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, the military pressure on, on Taiwan now, uh, over the last four or five years, basically since Tsai Ing-wen was elected the first term, um, how does that impact our broader um, economic relationship with Taiwan? I mean, you hear concerns from some quarters that, um, you know, we work so much with Taiwan on the tech side and that our private sectors work so much together uh, and that maybe that's a vulnerability um, for the United States. How, how do you see it? Do you see a connection between that military pressure on Taiwan and our future of our economic cooperation? I think they uh, are complementary. The, it, it reinforces, again, uh, our consistent policy position on dealing with this question. Um, you know, the One China policy deals, you know, focuses on the process of resolving these questions uh, compared to others who are focused on um, uh, basically stating their position and having others adapt to it. So focusing on the process on the military side prevents unwelcome or um, unfortunate military adventurism um, taking steps that, that um, again, the whole world uh, would not support. Uh, on the other side, I, I will I can't help but notice that this isn't just the U.S. And I've been saying this a long time. This is not the U.S. versus China. This is uh, a global position on what we're seeing out of Beijing recently, uh, stepping up military pressure uh, and squeezing Taiwan out of international um, uh, venues and such, and and attacking. Uh, rightful and, and completely um, justifiable economic interaction, not just with the US, but with others. And so uh, this weekend, uh, you saw a Czech delegation went to uh, Taiwan uh, to, again, expand on uh, great things that Taiwan's doing in terms of healthcare, especially now. Now more than ever, the contrast between the, how this corona thing was handled in the mainland and Taiwan is impossible to miss. And so uh, 89 members of, uh, uh, from Czech Republic to include the Prague mayor and the Senate uh, president uh, visited to discuss technology and, and health and all that stuff. And this was portrayed by the PRC as a betrayal uh, that made uh, the Senate president uh, the enemy of 1.4 billion Chinese people. I mean, that's not, that's not the point at all. This is uh, a very reasonable interaction with a uh, very um, capable and, and uh, um, again, given the handling of Corona necessary um, Taiwan experience and, and, uh, and wisdom. So yeah, we should continue to push that. 
Great, thank you very much. Well, thanks again for your time. I want to let you get back to your important work there. Uh, we appreciate you uh, you being here today and and joining for this conversation. Um, and we look forward to uh, disseminating your remarks far and wide following this following this program. So thanks again, Dave. Good to see you. Thank you. And, and I hope someday I get to get, you know actually show up in the auditorium and, and do this uh, in, a, in, in person. Yeah. But for now, this is this thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now I'd, I'd like to turn it over to um, uh, our second uh, really esteemed guest here, Minister of Economic Affairs, Mei Hua Wong. Um, Minister Wong is relatively new to her post, uh, just, just there a month or so, uh, arriving this past June after a very long career in the, in the ministry, including as Deputy uh, Minister and Vice Minister and DG of the Intellectual Property Office, which is such a front and center issue, uh, both here and in Taiwan um, over the last several years. So uh, Madam Minister, we're very honored to have you here today. I'd like to turn the stage over to you. Uh, please uh, turn on your webcam. Thank you. So the uh, Director Walter and all our friends joining online, good morning and good evening to our friends joining from Taiwan. And thank you to the Heritage Foundation for having me at this event. And thank you, Walter, for your kind introduction. As always, we stand ready to, for further discussion on the issue and cooperation for Taiwan-US strategic partnership. So the Heritage Foundation has always been the global thought leader for economic and political freedom values which are deeply held in Taiwan. Many Americans are still facing challenges posed by the pandemic and the wildfire in California and the hurricane Laura in Louisiana. I would like to firstly offer our best regards and wishes to American people. Uh, last time I visited Washington DC, was to co-chair the Taiwan US TIFA meeting in 2016. Uh, the past four years have been full of serious challenges to the global economy. Yet I'm proud to say that Taiwan and the United States have remained strong allies holding shared values. Our relationship is only getting stronger. Uh, speaking on today's topic, I would like to share with you three major areas uh, where I believe we can enhance our cooperation. First, the cooperation between Taiwan and the United, United States on the pandemic. The second, uh, concerning the supply chain cooperation. And last but not the least, a Taiwan-US bilateral trade agreement, the BTA. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the world. Taiwan is considered one of the few countries that have succeeded in keeping COVID-19 at bay. Businesses are operating as usual and people still go to work. Uh, last week, I was honored to participate in the 2020 Sense for the Year Dinner, Xianlian Fan, hosted by the American Chamber of Commerce in Taipei. The event gathered more than 600 of our close friends from the US and Taiwan, a rare and precious sight that impressed everyone attending the event. Uh, although Taiwan is fortunate to have contained the spread of the COVID-19, Taiwan has not avoided the pandemic's global economic impact, especially on external trade. Uh, Taiwan's GDP growth rate in the first quarter is 2.2%. However, it turned negative in the second quarter, yet a bounce back in July. This year's GDP growth is currently estimated to be 1.5%. The pandemic has prompted countries to reevaluate their supply chain security. So now is the time for like-minded partner to join hands and walk through these difficult times. 
as U.S. Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo has said, during tough times, real friends stick together. The U.S. and Taiwan have been cooperation on vaccine development and PPE supplies. So earlier this month, we were pleased to receive the U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, the Alex Azar. So during his visit, the secretary praised our epidemic control achievement and signed a joint statement with our Minister of Health and Welfare on U.S.-Taiwan cooperation to address global health challenges. Uh, it's another concrete example of our two nations' willingness to work together in the global fight against the, the pandemic. So turning to the supply chain cooperation, Taiwan is the United States' 10th largest trading partner. Our two-way trade existed uh, 81 billion US dollar in 2019. Uh, Taiwanese businesses have invest uh, 47 billion in critical industries in the US, including the electronics, information technology, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, of course, TSMC, the world leader in semiconductor manufacturing, also recently announced its intention to invest 12 billion to build a chip manufacturing factory in Arizona. Uh, we will closely follow the development of the CHIPS Act and the uh, American Foundry Act in the Congress and are ready to provide necessary assistance for our companies to increase their investment in the United States. Uh, Taiwan is widely trusted across the high-tech industries. Uh, our companies have been long-time supplier of key components to U.S. businesses, including the Apple, the Dell, the, and Qualcomm. Uh, the outlook for our cooperation in advanced technology is promising. First, the booming application of the 5G, AI, and recent increase in remote working have underscored the importance of information security. Uh, Taiwan has demonstrated itself as a reliable partner. The U.S. Uh, State Department named five of our 5G telecom companies as clean on the recent published clean career list. Just in the last week, Taiwan and the United States issued a joint declaration on 5G security. So while the U.S.-China trade conflict has driven many Taiwanese high-tech manufacturers to return from China and invest in Taiwan. Our strengths in the semiconductor and ICT industries and protection of uh, IP rights has drawn the world's attention during the pandemic. Our President Tsai announced the sixth core strategic industry in her inauguration speech. These industries include IoT, AI, information security, and biomedicine, which are also industries where the U.S. plays a leading role. We look forward to advancing our engagement with the U.S. in these areas. Uh, Taiwan embrace democracy, freedom, respect for human rights, and the rule of law. With the recent changes in Hong Kong, a survey by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong revealed that about 16% of the respondents believe that Hong Kong national security law will harm their business operation. And about 30% of the members were considering to move some of their business. Uh, Taiwan is a welcome destination for U.S. businesses that wish to continue their operation in the Asia Pacific and whose relocation to Taiwan will further strengthen the Taiwan-U.S. commercial relationship. Uh, as to the BTA issue, Taiwan, 
with our vibrant democracy, quality workforce, res respect for the rule of law, and sound IPR protection has made itself a secure and trusted supply chain partner for the United States. It is estimated that Taiwanese investment in the United States have created a total of uh, about uh, 373,000 American jobs. Uh, Taiwan-US BTA will further deepen the economic relationship, bringing concrete benefits to bilateral investment and trade in both ways, and stand as a clear example for the trade and supply chain in the Indo-Pacific region. Taiwan and the U.S. have been sharing a close partnership, and now is a critical moment for a closer relationship. Progress on the Taiwan-U.S. trade relationship has long been hindered by Taiwan's import restriction on the U.S. beef and pork. So three days ago, our President Tsai announced that under the uh, premise of protecting citizen health, scientific-based evidence, and international standards, as well as national economic interest and strategic objectives, Taiwan is going to ease the restriction on U.S. beef and pork imports. So far, a lot of the positive responses from the United States are promptly received. So this demonstrates that it is time for Taiwan US BTA. Of course, we understand there are efforts that still need to be made before the negotiation and sign of a bilateral trade agreement. I hope our American friends will consider Taiwan's shared value and strategic role in the post-pandemic era and support a BTA of our mutual benefits. Uh, Taiwan has continued its effort to ally domestic laws and regulation with international standards, such as the gold standards enshrined in the USMCA and the US-Japan Digital Trade Agreement. We are ready to sign a high standard BTA with the United States. So given the cross uh, relationship between Taiwan and UA, United States supply chains, uh, Taiwan's exclusion from regional trade agreement not only affect our supply chain security, but also the long-term US interests. Uh, Taiwan US BTA will not only integrate Taiwan's participation in the international community, it will also give other governments in the region to resist pressure from external actors and pursue similar agreement with Taiwan. So a more regionally integrated Taiwan would further enhance the economic security of the Indo-Pacific region. I would like to invite all of you to think about one question. Uh, what better way is there for like-minded country to support each other in the face of rising challenges, then to sign a bilateral trade agreement, uh, which will strengthen our economic and security ties. So thank you again to the Heritage Foundation for inviting me to speak today and for your long-standing support for Taiwan. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Minister Wong. Um, we've got a couple questions for you here as well, um, and I will get to those um, um, in, in just a second. You know, the uh, Heritage has been number one supporter of a free trade agreement with Taiwan for a very long time, um, and and still we're we're still uh, pushing very hard on it. I think it's important to note, sort of in the context of uh, Assistant Secretary Stilwell's remarks that it is fully in keeping with longstanding U.S. policy, the one China policy in the United States, fully in keeping with it. There is no problem with that from the U.S. side. Uh, so I hope from the U.S. side that we will also make a commitment specifically to a negotiation 
on an FTA, and maybe that grows out of this bilateral uh, dialogue that we have uh, established anew. Um, and that's what I wanted to ask you about, was this new dialogue, um, what kind of issues do you think it can get to beyond what is generally uh, included in a free trade agreement with the United States? Uh, labor issues, resource issues, uh, technology issues, things like that. What, what, what do you think we can accomplish with this beyond what we would in a in a very uh, sort of uh, focused discussion on a, an agreement? Uh, 这个框架下我们有怎么样子的议题超越可能自由贸易协定与美国签署的自由贸易协定的范畴包括像劳工资源技术等等那您认为我们可以成就什么样子的达成什么样的成果超越我们双方的对话我认为台湾在这个准备要加入不管是双边的自由贸易协定或者是区域的自由贸易协定台湾都有心理来准备最高标准那我们跟美国的如果能够签这个BTA 供应链的合作，那我觉得这个是一个啊，在这个啊后疫情时代，在美中贸易战之后啊，我想这是啊很关切的一个供应链供应链安全的议题。I uh, believe that uh, Taiwan is prepared to join a bilateral trade agreement or the regional free trade agreement, and we are prepared for a high standard agree agreement such as the BCA with the United States. And on top of the issues that you mentioned, I think uh, in addition, uh, industrial cooperation, especially in supply chain cooperation, uh, especially in this post-pandemic era and the post-US-China trade war, uh, is something we can look forward to and aim for. Uh, yes, I think that would be very important supply chain uh, cooperation. Um, you know, I asked um, Secretary Stilwell about this issue of the military threat to Taiwan. And, and uh, just to follow up on that for a second, I, you know, my point is there that there's a fine balance, I think, for us talking about the threat to Taiwan, because uh, it is a very serious threat. We all know that that's, you know, something we've been focused on for decades. Um, but we have to be careful not to be too successful in advertising the threat because there are a lot of mixed motives around trade issues and they're not all focused on freeing exports and imports and, and allowing for more investment. Some of them are, uh, sort of, let's just say, it, protectionist in, in nature. And so there's a lot of focus now, or not a lot, but a growing amount of focus on the threat that supply chains uh, face in Taiwan, that we don't want to be too dependent on Taiwan either. And I would say those are not very well founded at all, okay? But I think sometimes we um, we uh, risk being too successful in selling the threat that Taiwan focuses, uh, that Taiwan faces, and that that might hurt the relationship in some way. So just a, just a note to be, to be careful about that. Um, but speaking of, um, of this administration's um, perspective on trade and whoever wins the election, I think a perspective going forward is its concern with trade deficits. Um, and the United States still runs a, a big trade and growing deficit with uh, Taiwan. Um, so even though Tsai Ing-wen has addressed the principal problems that have been identified as obstacles, uh, in, in the trading relationship, you know, there might be others too. And the deficit is one of them that this administration in particular seems very focused on. So what can you say about that? How, how should we think about the deficit that the U.S. runs with Taiwan? Uh, 美国目前有一个很大的贸易赤字
在那个蔡英文总统，虽然他已经回应了解决这个我们双边的贸易关系之中的一个障碍，但是也许会有其他的类似的呃障碍或是议题，而这个美国与台湾的贸易赤字就是其中之一。那您对这个的看法为何？啊，首先要说明的就是啊。因为呃供应链安全的议题，所以从去年到现在，呃确实有非常多的台湾企业呃回到台湾来制造，那这个就产生制造了之后又直接啊、呃、卖到很多美国、欧欧盟的国家，所以呃第一个就呃造成这个呃回来台湾制造的越多，然后卖到美国越多，就造成这个。呃，台美之间的贸易逆差啊、呃、变得更大，这是第一个问题。呃、uh, ，the first、uh, issue is that in terms of supply chain security, uh, since last year, the return of Taiwanese businesses from mainland China, uh, returning their manufacturing、uh, locations to Taiwan, have increased our exports to the United States and European countries, and so their return of their manufacturing bases are increasing our sales. Our exports to the United States, and this is one of the issues,、uh, which is one of the factors leading to this increasing deficit with、uh, the U.S.'s increasing deficit with Taiwan. Ah, so we, ah, also understand that we have to maintain a more balanced relationship with China. So, ah, regardless of the past, we have been exporting a lot of U.S. products to Taiwan. We have also expanded. 从美国采购啊、呃、天然气跟啊、呃、这个相关的原油，那呃我想这个是啊、呃、我们啊、呃、也注意到这个问题，所以啊、呃、也有采取一些相关的措施。那我想呃另外一个就是呃可以比较健全的发展，就长期的供应链的这个合作，我想是不是也可以适度的来啊、呃、缓解这样的问题？ I understand that、uh, we need to have a more balanced re trade relationship with the U.S. And、uh, so, to address this issue, we have、uh, been buying a lot of、uh, U.S. agriculture, increased our procurement of LNG from the United States as well as crude oil. And、uh, so, we have noticed this problem, and we are adopting measures to address it. And another thing is that.、Uh, The long chain supply chain relationship cooperation is an area that we look at to solve this、uh, deficit issue.、Uh, that's、uh, that's a very good answer. Thank you. As I think,、um, you know, for the strategists in Washington,、uh, this was the outcome we were hoping for, right? We were hoping for more investment in Taiwan, especially in the high tech sector, and less in in China. So then it's hard, I think, from our perspective now, complain that there's too many. Imports coming from Taiwan. I mean, from a heritage perspective, we like imports. We may be the only organization in Washington. Well, I can think of a few others that that are as interested in imports as exports.、Uh, but you know, we should be welcoming because it's 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 something that、uh, we we were encouraging at least as a, as a government here.、Um, I think we have to leave it here,、uh, Minister Wong. Thank you very much for for tuning in in your evening.、Um, From Taiwan to be with us.、Uh, very much welcome your remarks.、Um, I want to thank everyone else that was involved in this,、uh, Secretary Stillwell and B. Kim Shao and others.、Uh, we hope that this can、uh, spur the relationship forward even more on the econ side. And so、uh, this won't be the last time you hear about this program. So we will be、uh, disseminating your remarks far and wide. As well, so thank you very much, and and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Walter. Thank you.